What's going on, everybody? We're back. Yeah, we're going to give it another shot. We're back on YouTube. Marcel Klinovic, the Butcher of Wall Street, here with Boss Blunt's Think Tank and Aaron, uh, which is AMC for All Telegram. You guys can check him out. We're not affiliated, but I love the information he puts out. So we're doing a multicast stream here. Thanks for dropping in on us. We should be back live on Facebook, uh, live on YouTube, live on Kick and Rumble. So feel free to jump in everywhere, you, anywhere you feel comfortable. What's going on, Paul, Jeweler? Nope. Not sure how much of that you guys caught on the, on the back end, but I'll, I'll just say it more succinctly this time. The fact that I was having this intense discussion with an 83-year-old man who has been a financial planner for the last 50 years, and I asked him to tell me the one most important piece of advice he possibly could give uh, since we're currently working on the uh, launch of Lit Exchange, and that was simply the fact that due diligence is the most important thing in the world in investing, that it can never be taken away from you. No matter how much manipulation occurs on the market, no matter what the current stock prices look like, if you do your due diligence, you will always have a leg up on those that do not. That is the difference between what they call smart money and dumb money. Uh, smart money is always doing diligence and dumb money likes to say that the, the, the work is done, the due diligence is done, but that's not the case. I don't believe that to be the case whatsoever. I have to do diligence every single day on my investments to make sure that things remain on track. I've got a vast amount of money. What is vast to me may not be vast to richer people, but that's okay invested in uh, meme stocks, precious metals, and, and various other sources. Whoever's got me mute, whoever doesn't have muted, you need to mute yourselves immediately. So we got a new stream going on YouTube, but like I said, this gentleman, uh, financial planner of the last 50 years, literally told me that the most important piece of advice he could give me was to do your due diligence, always. It is the most important thing in the stock market. 30% short interest speaks for itself. 350% cost to borrow average speaks for itself. It doesn't matter how much rehypothecations and naked shorts and married puts and calls and synthetic shares and so on and so on and so on are occurring. Because if you've done your due diligence, the current price action should not affect your thoughts. Charts, technical analysis, are but a reflection of what's currently happening against the stock. It's doing diligence every single day that really makes the difference, period. Take a quick look. As the earnings call is getting ready to kick off in about 15 minutes, AMC total revenue grew by 15.6% compared to this uh, second quarter of last year to 1,347,900,000. That is some fantastic revenue numbers for AMC theaters. The net income was a positive 8.6 million compared to a net loss of 121.6 million in the second quarter of 2022. Now keep in mind, in the second quarter of 22, AMC purchased a lot of theaters. So their net loss was due specifically to their expansions. Now that they're no longer doing so and when they're receiving excellent uh, box office numbers, they're actually able to pull in a profit. And diluted earnings per share, the second quarter of 2022 was a loss of 0.12, a loss of 12 cents per share. But now that is a positive 0.01, which may not seem like much, but that is still a beat on their earnings per share. And it means that they are absolutely profitable for the moment. We must continue to support our investment uh, in AMC in order to see them destroy the short thesis, period. They had a, a, a four cent loss on the earnings per share, I think is, is what they projected. So yeah. Yeah, it was a five cent beat. They were projecting, like you said, a four cent per share loss and it ended up being positive 0 0.1, 0 0.01. Hey, that's solid. That's solid. Per share, there's 1.5 billion shares. I'd say that's really fucking solid for 1.347 
billion in total revenue. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Rich Greenfield. Rich Greenfield was, uh, you know, has been working with shorts, it seems, for a long time. You know, everything he's ever said about AMC theaters has been negative, And I think it's pretty obvious why it seems like, you know, uh, CNBC, uh, big banks, prime brokerages uh, have massive short positions against AMC. And they're putting their cronies like Charles Gasparilla and Richie Greenfield to uh, try to downplay AMC's success in an effort to keep new investors from piling in, even though there's already 4 million verified investors in the stock. Looking at a Forbes article right now, and, well, they couldn't bullshit this one. Uh, they had to report, AMC reports highest ever monthly revenue after Barbie and Oppenheimer's success. After second quarter sales beat expectations. Even Forbes at this point could not deny that, quote, AMC Entertainment's third quarter is off to an explosive start because of successful box office hits like Barbie and Oppenheimer. With revenue in July setting a monthly record for the theater chain... <coughs> CEO Adam Marin said Tuesday. Guys, you gotta mute yourselves. If you come in here and you're not muted, I'm gonna shut down the stream. Need you all muted. Aaron said in the company's second quarter report that releases for Barbie, Oppenheimer, Mission Impossible, and Sound of Freedom Freedom in July had combined for AMC's highest monthly revenue ever. AMC's total revenue grew by 15.6% year over year to $1.35 billion in the second quarter from April to, April to June, beating the $1.29 billion expected by analysts as the company recorded a 12% growth in attendance. Net income was $8.6 million to the positive after reporting a net loss of $121.6 million the previous year. All time, baby. All time? That sounds like, okay, I just want, I just, I'm just throwing things out here, but that sounds like the acts of a CEO who wants to destroy the company. <laughs> <laughs> you got that whole, I, I just, I just can't understand the logic behind the Adam Aaron's trying to destroy the company. It just doesn't make any fucking sense. It just doesn't, like, why? Take our ideas, um, you know, and use them, the popcorn, the credit cards, the NFTs, the, the popcorn tins, you know, all of the stuff that he does, the interactive. Why would you do all that? Make the company stronger so you can make the company weaker. This isn't like some Sun Tzu, uh, you know, uh, Sun Tzu, uh, you know, appear strong when you're weak, like kind of bullshit thing. Like, no, he, he's, he's making steps to make the company stronger, and it's showing. You know what? 
As a matter of fact, you're absolutely right. Adam Aaron has turned other companies around as the former CEO. He has turned unprofitable companies into profitable companies before, and he's made a great living doing it. You know, there are people out there saying that he's trying to bankrupt the company and this and that, but the man is the number one largest shareholder of AMC Theaters. He has over 8 million shares, 8 million shares of AMC uh, theater stock, whether that be uh, preferred equity or common stock, uh, that I know to be a fact. Uh, also, why would stock brokerages in Europe continue to delist AMC's preferred equity ape? Because I'm seeing right now that as of yesterday, a stock brokerage firm by the name of M1, M as in Mary, one as in the number one, have delisted AMC preferred equity stock, Ape shares. It's almost as if they know that Chancellor Zern is going to rule in favor of allowing the settlement conversion or reverse split, which could potentially cause a massive uh, shortage of Ape shares that broker dealers will be forced to buy back. What are your thoughts, brother? Yep, M1 released a statement yesterday that is visible on any user's account that holds APE, AMC Preferred Equity shares, and it said, this security is no longer supported by the M1 finance system. Securities become unsupported when they are delisted from M1 supported exchanges. Your account will continue to trade as normal, but will not add to a delisted security. Once you remove this security from your portfolio, we will sell it in the next trade window. So it appears as if they're trying to make this person uh, concerned and scared about holding this stock because they could very easily transfer it out. And that's exactly what they're doing. The person who, who posted this on Twitter said that they're calling today to find another stock brokerage in Europe because that's where they live, uh, to which they can transfer their shares of AMC's preferred equity. Uh, looks like M1 is really concerned about not having sufficient shares of APE and forcing people to closer positions now before an actual margin call occurs. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why we're currently working on Lit Exchange. Lit Exchange is a stock brokerage firm that is currently in development that we've been working on since September of 2021. Uh, so that's about one year and 11 months. Uh, I look forward to bringing that to you with our team in the coming months. Uh, these are the kinds of things that take a very long time because unlike Coinbase, we are not going to operate as an unregistered broker dealer. Uh, unlike Robinhood, we're not going to fuck retail through payment for order flow and running trades through over-the-counter trades constantly. We are here to run trades through lit markets, hence the name Lit Exchange. I'm tired of retail's order getting traded through dark pools. Stop trading in the dark. Keep an eye out for Lit Exchange. Go to litexchange.com or follow Lit Exchange LLC on Twitter. Allegedly, I've never seen them on the level right. two because I watched the level two after I placed my purchase. I'll buy like 37 shares or something, and, and you know, some weird odd number. And when I don't see that number roll up through the level two, I'm like, well, what the fuck happened to my order? You know, you're supposed to be going through a lit exchange. Um, so that is something that is absolutely needed. That's
that's that's actually will help combat what we're fighting now. Uh, you know, on top of everything that we're doing now, I mean, that that having an exchange that we know is actually going to send those to the lit lit exchanges is so important. So uh, I, I mm. applaud you for the work. I know it's been, it must be ridiculous getting something like that set up. I've set up a bunch of businesses, and, and that there's so much. Uh, paperwork and legality and bullshit that you're going to deal with just to even think about doing it, much less actually doing it. So I applaud you for, for having the persistence to push through on that. Like I said, I'm here if you need me help. I really appreciate that, my friend. You know, it, it is extremely difficult. Most people real think about, you know, starting a business, this and that. But when you start something like a, a stock broker dealer or a crypto broker dealer, there is a massive amount of regulatory and compliance uh, loopholes, uh, hoops, not loopholes, hoops that you have to jump through. Because we could always pull a loophole like Coinbase and avoid registering as a uh, FINRA approved and FINRA licensed broker dealer. But then a few years down the line, they're going to come after us just like they're currently suing Coinbase uh, for operating as an unregistered broker dealer. And that's a big problem. That's the opposite of what we want. We're looking for longevity uh, to help retail investors so that they're uh, actual purchases and sales actually make a difference on the stock market itself instead of just getting constantly run through OTC over the counter trades instead of constantly getting run through dark pools instead of losing millions of dollars every year uh, because Robin Hood is charging you more uh, under the table than they would if they just actually uh, charge you a commission up front so I'm tired of seeing things like that happen to retail investors and I we didn't see anybody else doing this there's no other companies that are doing this as a broker dealer. That's why I have four different brokerages right now because I don't trust a fucking one of them. And I think that retail deserves the opportunity to have their orders make a difference on the price of the stocks that they buy and sell to actually uh, not get front run every single time they make a trade and to feel confident that their money and investments are safe. And I'm, I, it, like you said, necessity is the mother of invention. And that's where this came about. If no one else is going to fucking do it, then we're going to fucking do it. Period. We've got the time, the experience, and the ability to make it happen. You know, and, and that's why we're that's why we're doing it right now, working on it so hard. And I'm really looking forward to bringing you guys more info in the near future. Yeah, no, it's definitely exciting. Uh, I, I just sent you. A, did you see the new fund from Market Watch today? I'd love to see it. Where, where's it at? Yeah, I just sent it to you in our in our uh, side Telegram group there. Um, Excellent. Exceptional. We're going to pull that up. It sounds great, brother. Thanks. Yeah, post over the Discord there so I can get it easier access. I can't switch to Telegram on my computer right now where it will knock me off uh, Streamlabs, which is the software for streaming online. And you know what? It's kind of FUD, but they're not exactly wrong. No, no worries. They posted AMC could face bankruptcy risk if ape conversion battle fails and strikes drag on, analyst warns. Now, I'm not really worried about the strike dragging on because that's kind of, uh, there's movies already that have been made that are currently being edited that are set to release soon. That shouldn't really be a big deal. Even if the strike takes another six months, there's going to be a plethora of releases still being, uh, still being uh, coming out on movie theaters. Uh, but even though AMC is profitable and has become a profitable company and has had its best quarter ever, in the short term, we need to think over the next several months, six months to a year, before, while AMC still has to pay their leases, their rent, they have to pay their expenses, their uh, you know, overhead, including employees and everything like that and their debts. And so in the meantime, they have to maintain profitability. And that means the, the issuance of more shares, the conversion of APE to AMC, uh, the reverse split to increase the value of the shares 10 times, uh, and the issuance of new shares, which as we saw, 
Hey, uh, Aaron, what happened in January of 2021 when AMC issued shares, bro? I believe we had, I think it went up a little bit at some point there. <laughs> want to bring a bring up a the fact that there is something interesting going on right now with the AMC lawsuit. So the Delaware Supreme Court has dismissed an emergency interlocutory appeal to take the suit to a higher court. Shorts are absolutely desperate here and they're trying to appeal Chancellor Zern's courtroom uh, and take this to the Supreme Court in Delaware. However, they have dismissed their interlocutory appeal, meaning that Judge Zern will be uh, issuing issuing her ruling, and it will stand. As you can see here, a telephone call with the Chance Court of Chancery employees are not judicial officers, and they do not constitute appealable interlocutory orders. Even if a telephone call with court staff could constitute an appealable interlocutory order, as Madrid contends, the handling of the April 27th, 2023 letter does not meet the strict standards for the court's acceptance of an interlocutory appeal under Supreme Court Rule 42. This appeal must be dismissed. Now, therefore, it is ordered that this appeal is dismissed by the court Chief Justice Collins J. Seitz Jr. Period. Ladies and gentlemen, this isn't going up the chain. Chancellor Zern has an open schedule tomorrow. And I would not be surprised to see something come 
in the coming days from Chancellor Zern, uh, either an acceptance or a denial of the settlement. But previously, the only issue with the settlement was that it was releasing claims of uh, ape investor claims. And that is exactly what AMC and the plaintiffs have removed from the settlement. Therefore, be co coming into compliance with what the Chancellor Zern, the judge, wanted to see for the settlement to be pushed through and approved. Now, once the settlement is approved, we can bet that there will probably be a 10-day window where AMC has to file some documentation with the Securities Exchange Commission. And then after that 10-day window, we are likely to see a conversion of APE to AMC on a one-to-one -one level. So for every one APE share someone has, they will receive one share of AMC. And then a reverse split of one to 10, bringing the one and a half billion shares of AMC and APE combined down to 150 million total shares at a 10 times equivalent value. This will likely happen immediately one after the next back to back. From there, it would be nice to see AMC issue shares on the open market, but it is likely that they may not do that because they are going to try to prevent uh, hostile takeovers from hedge funds which could go on and front run our trades as many hedge funds are also market makers as some hedge funds are also a market maker. So they could essentially front run retails buys, buy orders on those and purchase up the stock themselves. So in order to prevent, uh, say a hedge fund from taking over 10% or more of AMC, they could then sell them to a hedge fund that is actually friendly to them like Entera Capital. And some people may be concerned about that, but that is you are, when you trade on the stock market, you're dancing with the devil. You've got to make friends in places that retail investors do not understand, and that includes with prime brokerages and hedge funds, because retail investors individually do not have the money to purchase hundreds of thousands or millions of shares at one moment. So people need to realize that Entera Capital may be making money off of their purchases of APE, but that is what hedge funds do. They have massive amounts of money. They lock in gains. And if they were to buy some shares of AMC and then resell them on the open market, that would likely create further uh, pressure, positive pressure on the stock price as the price goes up, uh, further creating fear of missing out buying by retail investors, delta hedging by broker dealers, and gamma squeezing of the stocks themselves, leading to a higher implied volatility on the options chain, uh, further FOMO buying, further delta hedging by broker dealers and short hedge funds and prime brokerages, and further gamma squeezing. It is a vicious cycle, the likes of which we saw in January of 2021 when AMC went up, you know, over a thousand percent in a matter of a couple of days to the point where broker dealers like Robinhood uh, and Weeble and others had to uh, pull the buy button on the stocks out of sheer desperation. And because they're able to pull the buy button, that is part of the reasons why I own so many call contracts on AMC and AMC1. AMC1 would entitle me to 100 shares of AMC common stock and 100 shares of AMC preferred equity APE uh, shares. Uh, therefore, if the buy button gets pulled, I would still be able to sell some of my call contracts to market makers or hedge funds or prime brokerages at a premium and take my premium and exercise the remainder of my call contracts, thereby increasing my position, increasing gamma squeezing and delta hedging by broker dealers, prime brokerages and family offices, etc. So I know it sounds a little complicated, but really it's uh, quite clear to me uh, exactly how I aim to do that. And we saw that from uh, the CEO of Interactive Broker, Interactive Brokerages, uh, that's the name of the company, IBKR. Uh, he specifically told us that if retail wanted the squeeze in January of 2021, they would have exercised their long calls, period. Now, this is not financial advice. I'm just telling you what we've heard directly from the chief executive officer of one of the world's largest stock brokerage firms. And the fact that he said, I was so scared, I cannot even tell you how scared I was of a domino bankruptcy. That's a quote. In addition, since I've got some silence um, to fill, 
we have some screenshots here. Somebody sold a fractional share of AMC today on Robinhood on August 8th at 935 in the morning for $109.89. They didn't sell one share. They didn't sell half a share, but they sold 0 0.000091 shares of AMC. Not even it's a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a share through their brokerage account with Robinhood and it was executed at an average price of $109.89 on August 8th at 935 a.m. And this is really interesting because I recall some of you might recall this as well. On January 28th, 2021, when the buy button was pulled, exactly five minutes after the market opened, just like this at 9.35 a.m., some people were selling fractional shares of GameStop for around $4,000, $5,000 per fractional share at that very moment, right before they pulled the buy button on GameStop. Uh, and I remember seeing quite a few of those, you know, people selling a, you know, 0 .0001 share of GameStop for you know forty three hundred forty five hundred dollars there was a lot of those screenshots rolling around at the time and now we're starting to see something similar you know there's four zeros after the decimal and then nine one shares of amc that's a massive fucking number uh, that's a tiny number to get such a massive number of 109 dollars and 89 cents I believe it was 39 days for GameStop before the January 21 run-up. Yes. The longest ever in existence, to my knowledge, is Overstock. And coincidentally, Overstock.com was on the th Reg Show Threshold Securities list for 666 days. The number of the beast before it squoves. But GameStop, and it, yeah, it was only 38 or 39. That's correct. anyone in the think tank there's got a direct link to the earnings call the earnings call is about to start up we're going to move over to that if you've got a link open to it drop it in the discord chat for me gotcha. looks like we've got it here we've pulled it up thank you go thank you guys we've got it pulled up here looks like Thank you, John. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. When I think of our second quarter 2023 results and our start to the third quarter, I want to share this with all of you. In plain English, AMC blew it out of the water in the second quarter of 2023, and I might add, that the third quarter of 2023 is starting out to be roaring hot too. Around here, the metaphors we often use to describe our circumstances involve famous movie quotes. Our recent results in Q2 and so far in Q3 of 2023 bring to my mind Bruce Willis as Lieutenant John McClane in the Die Hard movies when he would say, yippee ki -yay. He would then add a colorful expletive that I cannot repeat on this call. I think the closest I can get to it 
would be yippee ki Mother Ducker. So, yeah, that's the second quarter of 2023. Without being too dramatic, the stakes are high, and we're surrounded by some uncertainties and risk, but it's certainly encouraging for us all to take a moment this afternoon and celebrate our immensely positive results in the most recently completed quarter. AMC's results in Q2 2023 were well ahead of last year's second quarter and well ahead of the market's expectations. Indeed, AMC exceeded consensus market expectations across the board, generating post-pandemic records for revenue, adjusted EBITDA, net income, and earnings per share. We now have posted three consecutive quarters of positive adjusted EBITDA, and this quarter, for the first time since Q2 of 2019, that's four years ago, we generated positive earnings per share, yet another milestone in our path towards ongoing recovery. While we still have much work ahead of us on this front, AMC's glide path to eventual recovery continued with significant pace in the second quarter of 2023 as our results set new records and represent AMC's strongest second quarter in four full years. Following an impressive start to the year in the first quarter of 2023, the second quarter yet again showed great progress. AMC saw more than a 12% growth in attendance, more than a 15% growth in total revenue, and a 71% increase, 71% increase in adjusted EBITDA compared to the second quarter of 2022 last year. Indeed, adjusted EBITDA in the second quarter of 2023 was $182.5 million, the highest such quarterly figure for AMC since the fourth quarter of 2019. Our ongoing progress is obvious and ever so encouraging. Combining AMC's commitment to innovation with a notable increase in both the number and the quality of movie titles from our studio partners, movie theaters are once again captivating audiences and driving an audience and attendance back to theaters in general, and especially at AMC, we're driving audiences and attendance back to AMC theaters. Our theaters across the globe welcomed more than 66 million guests in the second quarter of 2023, up 12.2% over the prior year's Q2, and it was our highest quarterly attendance number also since the fourth quarter of 2019. Let's use the second quarter domestic industry box office as a proxy for the size and the improving health of our industry overall. Looking at domestic injury box office for the second quarter, ticket sales grew by nearly 15% compared to the same quarter last year, benefiting from six movies that grossed more than $100 million each. Anchored by Super Mario Brothers and franchises such as Guardians of the Galaxy, Spider-Man, Fast and Furious, Transformers, and The Little Mermaid, these titles provided compelling movie-going experiences. Year-to-date, through today, in 2023, 19 films crossed the $100 million mark in gross ticket revenues compared to only 12 during the same period in 2022. That is a 58% increase. And the total number of wide-release films grossing more than $5 million also continues to rise from 24 in Q2 of 2022 to 36 in Q2 of 2023, 
that's a 50% increase. One area that has far exceeded pre-pandemic norms has been AMC's per patron revenue. AMC moviegoers are consistently seeking out the most immersive sight and sound experiences, especially important to AMC, as we offer more premium large format screens than any other exhibitor. You know what premium large format screens are. IMAX, Dolby Cinema, and our various house brands, including Prime at AMC, and iSense in Europe, among others. Demonstrating how significant these premium large format screens are to AMC's success. The so-called PLFs represent only 5.3% of our total screens globally, but an astounding 19% of our second quarter ticket revenues. AMC's imaginative offerings at our concession stands and in our dine-in theaters also helped AMC to generate in the second quarter for food and beverage revenues per patron, $7.36 a head. That is within one penny of our all-time high watermark for food and beverage spending per patron. Considering the enormous operating margins in our food and beverage business, this is contributing meaningfully to AMC's improving profitability. But to me, perhaps the most surprising second quarter statistic of them all is this one. Because of our determined and sustained pandemic era cost reduction efforts, along with ticket pricing initiatives and soaring food and beverage revenues, comparing Q2 2023 to Q2 of 2019, four years ago pre-pandemic, AMC's overall profit per patron after the cost of goods sold improved by an impressive 40%, 40% in the United States, and 22% internationally in constant currency, put those together, that's a 36% total global increase in our profitability per patron in constant currency. And if the Q2 domestic industry box office wasn't enough to lift our spirits and bolster our path to recovery, the month of July, the first month in Q3, was the highest grossing month for AMC in 12 years. And it was the second highest grossing box office month ever in our 103 year history. As you know, this performance in July was driven by the resounding success of titles such as Sounds of Freedom, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1, Oppenheimer, and for all of you dressed in pink, Barbie, among other titles. In the United States, the July box office represented a 5.8% increase compared to the pre-pandemic July of 2019, and a 20% increase compared to last year's July. For AMC globally, these milestones translated into July of 2023 being the highest revenue month for our company in our entire 103 year history. The first week of August is continuing with an incredibly strong showing with the domestic industry box office about double that of last year. This all speaks to what we at AMC have said time and time again. Studios are masterful at storytelling, and when they have great stories to tell, they are best showcased, in the words of Nicole Kidman, as dazzling images on our huge silver screens. Here at AMC, those stories are perfect and powerful 
and audiences are flocking to our AMC theaters in the United States and our Odeon cinemas in Europe and our AMC cinemas in the Middle East as a result. Looking forward to the rest of 2023, we have a slew of exciting movies yet to be released this year. They're coming. And barring complications to the timing of film releases due to the uncertainties arising from the writers and actors strikes currently well underway, unfortunately, we have good reason to believe that the second half box office will continue to show real strength this year. Even so, we will not get to 2019 pre-pandemic levels for this full year, 2023, but there is a clear trajectory upwards. Our hope is that COVID-19 is but a bad ancient memory by 2024 or 2025, even though as much as some of you hate it when I say the words COVID, we are still dealing with the aftermath of that pandemic. Now at this point, I'll pass the webcast over to our CFO, Sean Goodman, to provide more details on our financial results, after which I'll return to talk about some of our ongoing initiatives and AMC's plans for the future, as well as taking some of your questions. Sean? Thanks, Adam. Thanks, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. So before I begin my comments on our second quarter financial performance, I would like to just take one moment to provide a little bit of context behind our earnings release and 10Q issuance this morning, rather than our customary after the market issuance. We're going to be so fucking rich. As you know, the Delaware court is currently in the process of reviewing our proposed shareholder litigation settlement. A ruling by the court prior to the issuance of our 10Q could constitute a post-balance sheet event that might require an adjustment to our financial statements and thereby a possible delay in our regulatory filings and earnings release. So to avoid any such risk of a delay and the possibility of thereby missing our filing deadlines, we decided to release our results for the second quarter before the market opened this morning. Okay, so now on to our results for Q2, our strongest quarter post-pandemic, and a clear sign of our ongoing recovery. 2023 has continued, has continued to see box office recovery, <coughs> 1.7 billion in Q1 and now 2.7 billion in Q2. For the first half of 2023, the box office is now up approximately 20% from the same period last year. And remember, the first half of 22 was up almost four times from the same period in 2021. With attendance growth of 12.2% and revenue growth of 15.6% compared to the second quarter of 2022, we grew our adjusted EBITDA by 71% to a post-pandemic record of $182.5 million. This illustrates the operating leverage that is inherent in our business model. For the quarter, we achieved positive earnings per share for the first time since Q2 of 2019. Now, granted, it's a small positive number, but for those of us who have been working tirelessly for AMC to recover from the depths <coughs> of the pandemic, it is yet another milestone along our recovery. In the North American business, total revenue increased by 19.8% compared to Q2 of 2022. This was driven by an attendance increase of 15%, admissions revenue per patron increase of 2.2%, and food and beverage revenue per patron increase of 9.2% to a record all-time high of $8.22, surpassing the previous record that was set just last quarter and an amount that is 47.3% above pre-pandemic Q2 2019. In the international business, on a constant currency basis, total revenue increased by approximately 1% compared to Q2 of 2022. 
This was driven by an attendance increase of 4.6%, admissions revenue per patron decrease of 1%, and food and beverage, food and beverage revenue per patron increase of 6.5%. International food and beverage revenue per patron for the quarter was 34.5% above pre-pandemic Q2 of 2019. It's worth noting in the international business that during the quarter, we saw a 27.6% decline in other revenue. This decline is associated with relatively high levels of gift card and package ticket expirations and also relatively high theater rental income all in the prior year period and associated with the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on our business. As the industry box office continued on its recovery trajectory, our revenue growth in the quarter was enhanced as guests responded favorably to our targeted marketing campaigns and increasingly adopted our industry-leading app. In addition, our creative food and beverage options, such as movie-themed cocktails and unique collectible items, encourage frequent visits to the concession stands or contributing to both revenue growth and our overall profitability of the business. Furthermore, visually stunning and action-packed films inspired audiences to experience our premium large format offerings. Premium large format revenue, including 3D, represented 30.1% of domestic admissions revenue in Q2 of 23, compared to 26.7% in the second quarter of 2022. And in our international markets, premium format revenue represented 16.3% of admissions revenue compared to 157 in the second quarter of 2022. Moving to the balance sheet. We ended the quarter with liquidity of $643 million comprised of $435 million of cash and cash equivalents <coughs> and $208 million of undrawn credit facilities. Operating cash generated, this is a non-GAAP measure representing cash from operating activities after deducting capital expenditures and before both debt servicing costs and deferred rent payback, was a positive number of $100 million for the quarter. This is almost double the operating cash generated in Q2 of 2022. Our top two capital allocation priorities remain one, liquidity, and two, strengthening the balance sheet. During the second quarter, we continue to make progress in this regard. We raised $34.2 million of gross equity capital. We repurchased $42 million of debt at an average discount of 34%, and we repaid $27.1 million of deferred rent. The deferred rent balance at the end of the second quarter was $96.5 million, and we plan to reduce this balance by another approximately $40 million by the end of this year. So this year to date, we've raised $189 million of gross equity capital. We've lowered the principal value of our debt by $245 million through debt repurchases or exchanges of debt for equity. And we have repaid $61 million of deferred rent. Adding that all up, we've reduced our liabilities by $306 million thus far in 2023, and a total of $689 million since the beginning of 2022. In addition, we began the third quarter of 2023 with a purchase of yet another $24 million of debt during the month of July at a discount of approximately 28%. CAPEX for the quarter net of landlord contributions was $46.6 million, and we expect net CAPEX in 2023 to be in the range of $150 to $200 million. During the second quarter, we also continued to actively manage our theater portfolio. We added two new theaters, and we closed 16 theaters. So this brings the total number of locations closed since the pandemic began to 152 locations, and the total new locations opened to 57 for a net reduction of 95 locations. And note that the combined 57 new locations continue to outperform the 152 closed locations prior to their closings. The pandemic almost crippled our business. 
Since then, we have made enormous progress in enhancing the moviegoing experience at AMC. This has resulted in very meaningful improvements to our per patron profitability metrics. At the same time, we've also maintained strict cost and capital expenditure discipline. And because of our actions and a rapidly recovering industry box office, our revenue and our adjusted EBITDA have shown strong growth. And we have also been very active in the capital markets. We've taken opportunities to strengthen our balance sheet and to prepare AMC for a bright future. With the post-pandemic record-breaking second quarter behind us, our recovery to date is clear. However, we're not yet ready to declare victory. The box office remains around 16% below pre-pandemic levels, and there's some downside risk with the ongoing screenwriters and actors' strikes. And with our fixed cost structure and relatively high debt servicing costs, these are exacerbated by interest rate increases over the last 17 months, we continue to burn cash on the bottom line. Based on what we know today, we're optimistic about the remainder of the year, and we believe that the 2023 box office could exceed 2022 by more than 20%. However, if the strikes are prolonged, or if our ability to access the capital markets is constrained, then our ongoing recovery glide path and our ability to continue to take the necessary actions to strengthen our balance sheet and to ensure a full and sustained recovery may be in jeopardy. And now I'll hand the webcast back over to Adam. Thank you, Sean. I'd like to give you all a brief update on seven specific items related to some of our thinking, as well as our exciting ongoing initiatives and our current plans. First, on liquidity. We've made many public statements throughout this year and again in recent weeks that AMC has skillfully charted our way through turbulent waters at a time when several of our most important competitors failed and that we watch our liquidity position very closely. We've made it clear that our strategy first is to survive and then to thrive. Of course, we are heartened by the fact that we had $643 million of liquidity at the end of the second quarter of 2023. But some who follow us closely nonetheless underestimate the potential for cash burn in the seasonally weaker winter months. This is especially true given the uncertainties of the writers and actors' strike, since no one knows when they will end. We intend to make sure that AMC does not run out of cash by continuing to seek the flexibility to raise fresh capital on the best possible terms. Our highest obligation to stakeholders is to avoid the pitfalls that sank others in our industry into financial ruin. Second, on balance sheet management. In the second quarter, we methodically raised $34 million of equity and retired $42 million of debt. Sean, in his remarks, gave a lot of other statistics, various time frames of how much equity we raised and how much debt we retired. I am particularly intrigued by this statistic, which you haven't heard yet on the call. Since the creation of the APE preferred equity units in August of 2022, about a year ago, AMC raised $418 million of equity and retired $548 million of debt, including deferred rent. Needless to say, this is very helpful as we contemplate our current liquidity profile. Third, on so-called PLF screens, premium large format screens, as I mentioned earlier, a PLF screen grosses about four times a regular non-PLF screen. 
So it's kind of obvious that we're happy that we have more PLF screens than any other movie theater company in the world. And assuming that we have sufficient cash reserves to invest in growth initiatives in a big way, which at the moment we do not, but we could, uh, looking a little further forward, assuming we have sufficient cash reserves to invest in growth initiatives, we would intend to add a significant number of additional premium large format auditoriums to our system. Fourth, on innovative theater programming. Over the past two years, we have experimented with sports programming and have featured great musical artists on our big screens. We will continue to look for opportunities to expand those innovative efforts. Fifth, on popcorn. Our new lines of ready to eat and microwave popcorn for the home are literally flying off the shelves at Walmart stores throughout the United States and on walmart.com. They were launched in March and April of 2023, and we would describe sales as being brisk and pleasantly ahead of our expectations. So much so that we are now looking seriously to expand into other grocery chains and other retail outlets. Once we get to a full national rollout in multiple channels, which could take a while to be fair, but based on the early results so far, I would not at all be surprised if this turns out to ramp up, perhaps becoming up to a $100 million per annum revenue source for AMC Entertainment. Next, on premium gourmet candy. Our popcorn line has been so successful that we are now confident that we should keep going in the area of food. So much so that I expect that later this year or early next, AMC will definitely introduce a private label line of various AMC theaters branded premium gourmet chocolate candies and gummies. I'm eating some samples baby. right now as we speak on this call. The taste and the packaging are wonderful in my opinion. And speaking of the taste, these chocolate covered pretzels are like to die for good. Like John, like move them away. I can't see. No more. Calories, calories, calories. Fantastic. We believe we will be successful with the candy lines as we've been successful with the popcorn line. It goes without saying, of course, that we will still sell Hershey's and Nestle products in our theaters. But just as a year or so back, we asked the late Orville Redenbacher to make some room on shelves for our popcorn, so too we will ask the long gone Milton Snavely Hershey and the long gone Heinrich Henri Nestle for their understanding that premium AMC candies coming to AMC theaters are now in the works as well. And the last item on merchandise. Early in the period where retailers, well, retail shareholders took control of AMC, which basically started in earnest in January 2021. Through suggestions that came in on Twitter and other channels, retail investors directed our attention to the possible profits that can come from the sale of movie theme merchandise and AMC branded merchandise. We've had meaningful successes in this area, especially with our collectible popcorn vessels sold almost weekly in quantities of between 25,000 and 100,000 units almost each weekend at prices that have ranged from about $20 to about $65 each. 
We plan to significantly expand our merchandise efforts in 2024 and beyond with a greater variety of items and a larger available quantity of items for sale. It is not uncommon today for us to sell out of some of our movie theme merchandise in the opening weekend of a movie's release. Uh, movies run a lot longer than the first 72 hours, and I think our merchandise business would expand if we have greater supply to sell. In closing these remarks, I'd like to address directly the millions of our AMC showers, so many of whom pay attention to what I say on Twitter and to these earnings calls. In a tweet yesterday, I expressed my sincerest possible gratitude for all of your support. If you read my Twitter feed, you, though, as I do, you'll see there's a lot of light, but also a lot of heat directed my way. That's okay, I have broad shoulders, and the variety of views comes with the territory when there are so many voices and so many opinions. As I read these inbound comments, I see that some who care about our company deeply still don't get the nuance of our current circumstances or wish that I would just cheerlead only the good news, but that's not what CEOs are supposed to do. The success we have seen this year in our theaters, especially in Q, including Q2 and Q3 results so far, is what makes us optimistic that we are on the right road and that by 2024 or 2025, we will look back on the decade of the 2020s with amazement and pride as to how well at AMC we dealt with the most challenging hands of cards ever directed our company's way in the century plus of its long existence. But despite that medium term confidence, in the short term, and some of you don't like to hear this, but in the short term, AMC has some serious liquidity issues to solve. We should not oversimplify that it will be easy to overcome the obstacles and hurdles in our path. However, this AMC management team has proven over the past few years that AMC is highly able in liquidity management. So I have every confidence that we will continue to execute well to do what is needed. To the extent humanly possible, I am determined that at AMC, we will rise to every and to any challenge. Thank you for listening. Sean, let's now move to questions, both from shareholders and from industry analysts on the call. Thanks, Adam. Um, so quite a few questions from shareholders here. Um, first question relates to our strategic direction. And the question is, what are the top priorities for AMC both today and in the future? Are we considering uh, M&A opportunities? You know, so some of you have asked me on Twitter, like, why are we still talking about COVID? And that's because in the, we are because in the movie theater industry, the industry-wide box office, which is the basic size of our industry, is still below 2019 levels. Uh, and that's a lingering problem because if you look at the box office, 2017, 2018, 2019, this industry was sized for about an $11.5 billion box office. And in 2020, it was $2 billion. 2021, it was $4.5 billion. 
2022 is seven and a half billion. This year, I hope it hits 9.5 billion. Might hit more, might hit less. We won't really know till the end of the year. It's going to be a lot more than 2022. But we're still down below pre-pandemic norms. And if you know, I remember when we shut our theaters in March of 2020. And people were predicting we'd be back to normal at four to six weeks. Our theaters were shut for five and a half months. Some of our theaters were shut for almost a year. And the box office fell by more than 80% that year. And it still was, you know, uh, way below pre-pandemic levels. Uh, even now, three full years later. So we've had to adjust our strategy because the movie theater industry has come back slowly. And so our strategy has become survive, then thrive. Uh, we have had to take the steps to make sure this company survives. And not all companies in our industry can say that. Other companies with big brand names, both big chains, chains that you would recognize and small chains that had a cult following in some markets in Texas and California, they went bankrupt. And a lot of their theaters didn't reopen. Uh, so first we have to survive. And as I said, you know, uh, we like the results in April, May, June, July, and August of this year are fabulous. Um, so I think we're going to start to move from the survive phase to the thrive phase. To make sure we get there, and you've been hearing me say this as a broken record for two years now, but especially in the last year, we must be able to raise capital if we need to. Uh, because the dumbest thing we could ever do as a company is run out of cash. And other companies in this industry have run out of cash. And some of the armchair quarterbacks on Twitter who give me advice every day, if I followed their suggestions, we would have run out of cash a long time ago. Or if I follow their suggestions now, we'll run out of cash soon. So the most important thing as part of the strategic direction of this company is make sure that we have ample cash reserves to outlast the aftermath of the pandemic. Because I've already said, you know, in 2024, 2025, it's going to look pretty bright. But if we were to run out of cash before we get to 2024 or 2025, that would be a disaster. And that's a disaster that I simply will do everything in my power to make sure that this company avoids. So when we talk about strategic direction, I think that we've got to make sure that we put this company in a position to be able to raise capital. That's what the shareholder vote in March for, on March 14 was all about. Next, as we have sufficient cash to survive to the glory days of 2024 or 2025, there are a lot of things that we can do with that cash. Because right now, I, you know, Sean said we've taken our capex spending down to 150 to $200 million a year. Three or four years ago, we were investing $500 million of capex a year in our business. Right now, it's prudent to husband cash, to save cash so that we don't run dry. But there will be a time that we have much more cash reserves than we have currently, either because we will generate it from operations or because we'll raise it. And then the question is, what do you do with that cash? And here's my list. First, we need to spend some money to uh, affect what I'll call deferred maintenance on some of our theaters. Um, we got, you know, we, we pulled our CapEx spending way down 
during the COVID impacted years. And we've seen examples of leaking roofs and breaking air conditioners and uh, boilers that provide heat in the winter that are towards the end of their life cycle and they're just breaking. They need to be repaired. Uh, we have thousands of our screens where the movie projectors are getting towards the end of their useful life. And we are going to need to invest capital to replace those projectors. The good news of that, however, is we've already made the decision that when we replace these projectors, we're putting in laser screens, uh, laser projectors, and laser lighting is uh, but to, it's a much brighter, sharper picture on the screen, and it's uh, quite an environmentally friendly initiative, too. Uh, next, there are growth initiatives within our theaters. I've already mentioned on this call premium large format screens. In the state of New York, until just recently, like in the past 12 months, it was illegal for movie theaters, most movie theaters, to sell alcohol. The New York legislature recently changed that law. But that means that we have a whole bunch of theaters where we probably should build full alcoholic bars um, into our theaters. One of the things I'm interested in is putting more variety of food items into our concession stands, which might, because our food and beverage sales are at a record high, that might require, you know, putting in ten to twenty thousand dollars of of equipment in a concession stand. Now, twenty thousand dollars doesn't sound much like much until you realize we got to put it in five hundred and seventy-five theaters. All of a sudden, you know, it's ten million dollars. Uh, next. We have had some circumstances where we've been able to add theaters to our network and we were able to bring them into our system very inexpensively. When I say very inexpensively, I'm saying we've been, we've been all in. Purchase price, transition costs, we've been able to bring some theaters into our system at three to four times expected EBITDA. That is such a bargain. We ought to do that all day long if we can find opportunities to bring good theaters into our network inexpensively. There's M&A opportunity. And there are two kinds of M&A opportunity, right? There's, there's just buy some movie theater chains. If we can do so, and I want to emphasize this, if we can do so at a bargain basement price, I have no desire to pay up to bring movie theater chains into our network. But if we can get them at a cheap price, that's value creation for our shoulders. And if we're going to raise a lot of cash, maybe we can do some transformative M&A as well, where we can look to expand to being something more than just a pure movie theater play. So that's sort of a strategic uh, uh, roadmap of where we might invest our monies if we have more money than we have today. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, I think that addresses that question very nicely. Um, there's some questions here about our theater uh, footprint. So, um, what are the expansion opportunities of that footprint, both US and internationally? And what are the opportunities to continue to close theaters, um, underperforming theaters, and improve our overall pot, um, our profitability? And also, how does premium large format fit into those plans? So on the theater footprint, you know, we've managed this like uh, maniacally over the last three and a half years. You gave the stats in earlier that we opened 50-something theaters, we closed 150-something theaters. Um, we didn't open any of the 50 lightly. We didn't close any of the 150 lightly. Um, we have, when you look at a company that has almost 1,000 theaters globally, we got some theaters that are brand new. We got some theaters that are 25 years old. We got some buildings in great shape. We got some buildings sort of at the end of their useful lives. We've got theaters where we've got great rent deals with landlords. 
and we've got theaters where you have terrible rent deals with landlords. We've got some theaters in unbelievably successful malls and other theaters in unbelievably unsuccessful malls. Uh, and uh, and so we, we have a whole department here, our real estate department, our development department, that's paying attention to every single one of these theaters, every single one of our landlord relationships. Uh, and where the, success, where the theaters are successful, we cheerfully pay the rents. Uh, where the theaters are not successful, we enter into cooperative dialogue with the theater landlord to see if they're willing to lower our rent, to keep us around, and to continue to drive traffic to their uh, other properties nearby. Uh, and in many cases, we're quite successful um, in getting landlords to adjust rents. In addition to that, I would say we have spectacular relationships with all of the large mall operators in the United States, the Simons, the Brookfields, the Westfields, and a whole slew of, you know, of other theater owners. Um, and I could name another probably 10 REITs who have, you know, uh, anywhere from five to 50 of our theaters. I think we maintain excellent relationships with each. Um, and um, one of the things, because our relationships are so good, as they build new malls, they often want us to come along for the ride. Westfield just opened up a beautiful new mall in Topanga to the northwest part of Los Angeles. And that theater that we opened there is already one of the 20 most profitable theaters we have in the United States. It opened in the past year. A uh, year and a half back, actually I think it's two years back now, uh, we brought in the Grove, an Americana brand in LA and in Glendale in Southern California at Rick Caruso's retail establishments. The Grove is now the third most profitable theater in the entire United States for AMC. So that's an example of a theater that we brought into the network just in the past two years. And we continue to talk to uh, landlords all over the place that we're ready, willing, and able to bring theaters into our system uh, if we can do so uh, on good economic terms. And as an example of that, literally just in the last two weeks, we brought a theater into our system in Reading, Pennsylvania. It's not exactly as big a market as downtown Los Angeles. But that's a theater where the seats were already reclined, and that theater enjoyed a 65% market share of its surrounding communities, and we got a very attractive price that brought that theater into our system quite reasonably. So we are continuing to look at pruning our system downwards, where we have underperforming theaters and can't renegotiate rents. We're looking to keep our theater network the same size as it is today by renegotiating rents. And we're looking to grow our theater network um, as our theater landlords want to take us where they go. And then, of course, I mentioned there's always M&A opportunity uh, as well, but there's nothing immediately on the horizon to report on that front. Thanks, Adam. Let's talk a little bit about food and beverage. There are quite a few questions about that because it's been enormously successful for us post-pandemic. Um, question here about plans to potentially expand the menu offering at theaters or plans to open restaurants at a theater or take food orders directly from the seats? So, look, this is um, something I was, this is a subject near and dear to my heart. I'm an eater. If any of you have seen me sideways, you know, I'm not the slimmest guy around, although I weigh a lot less than I did 20 years ago. Um, and, yeah, and no more chocolate covered pretzels. <laughs> or, or the chocolate covered almonds are pretty good. good. Anyway, um, I think AMC was leading the way before the pandemic in having the biggest variety at our concession stands. Remember, we introduced something called feature fare uh, all across the system here in the United States, where we made a lot of a lot of 
of progress and variety. We put in as a brand standard for all AMC theaters in the United States, Coke Freestyle Machines. I counted more than 140 flavors come out of those Coke Freestyle Machines. Um, I think that's an enormous advantage for us over theater chains, um, you know, which still are offering 8, 12, or 14 flavor choices. Um, those Coke Freestyle Machines don't come cheap, but I think that was a very smart investment for us. But then COVID hit. And when we came out of COVID, we came back with a very limited menu, which we tried to um, grow back to sort of the feature fair levels. But then came supply chain shortages. And then came labor shortages. And all of a sudden, some of our more complicated items were difficult for our staff at the concession stands to execute, which then would slow down delivery, which would lengthen lines at the concession stand. And you're always trying to balance variety of items against speed of purchase in a concession stand, because no one wants to wait in a long line. I don't blame them for that. And I'd say where we are today is we're back up to about 80% of the feature fair variety at the height of where we were in 2018. And in talking with our food and beverage department, they'd like to see our variety of items get to expand up to feature fair levels, uh, you know, within 12 months of today. But, you know, that was just talking about variety of menu items. But when you look at the success of our food and beverage effort, remember, uh, let's use United States numbers, Pre-pandemic in 2019, we were doing $5 a head in per patron food and beverage spending. In the United States, we're doing over $8 of food and beverage spending today per head. That is a staggering increase when you realize that if you take out only cost of goods sold, so this isn't the labor at the concession stand and not the capital cost the equipment and stuff, but just like the cost of the the syrup and the cost of the corn and the cost of the hot dogs and the rolls and the nachos and all the stuff, the candy that we sell. Like we have more than an 80% margin in our food and beverage business. And for our food and beverage business to be up as much as it is, uh, 736 was the number globally in the second quarter, this is a staggering success for us. So I really want to compliment our F&B department uh, led by a guy named Hank Green um, we're just hitting that out of the park in F&B spending. And that's what's driving such a big increase in per patron profitability for AMC. Remember the stat I gave, our per patron profitability, this isn't just food and beverage, this is total uh, per patron profitability. It's a combination of expense reductions, ticket price initiatives, food and beverage success, our food and our, our pay, profit for patrons is up 40% in the United States. It's up 22% internationally. These are stunning numbers. Adam, um, our, our shareholders are, appear to be uniformly very excited about the retail popcorn uh, sales and our initiatives there. And so their questions about uh, do we plan to expand this further and are there other uh, potential revenue streams similar to retail popcorn uh, that can help grow? The business. So yeah, I couldn't be more excited about the popcorn success. Um, you know, we spent over a year in our food and beverage department working on the right recipe for home corn because we, whether it was in the bag ready to eat or microwave pouches that you microwave at home, we wanted it to taste. It wanted it to taste just like it tastes in the movie theater. And by the way, there's a secret to our popcorn. Not all popcorn is created equal. Uh, there are different grades of corn, and we buy the best there is. So one of the reasons why our popcorn is so good at AMC theaters is we buy the best corn. It's like graded. Um, and, um, uh, and so our corn that's at home tastes great, and the sales, like Walmart can barely keep it on the shelves. 
and they keep on reordering and they keep on selling out. Uh, so yes, we, we gave Walmart a six month exclusive uh, to, because they gave us so many store locations. We rolled out the AMC popcorn in like 2,600 Walmart stores. Very few brands get to roll out on day one in 2,600 Walmarts. You know, normally you'd get a fraction of that and you prove your way. But they believed in our brand and it's been a big success. And we're happy that, to give them the full exclusive. But yeah, well, as soon as the exclusive is up, we'll, we will have conversations with all the major grocery chains, with all the major retail outlets in the country. Uh, I'd like to see, you know, it'll take a while, but I'd like to see AMC popcorn on um, every shelf where, where you can buy snack products. Uh, there are other things too. I've already talked about the candy products. That's next. And there are a whole host of other ideas that we have uh, to grow revenues for the company. But in the interest of time, I'll either save those for another earnings call or for, or for Twitter. Um, final question here about the trading of our shares. And there's a few questions here related to can you comment, Adam, on the very high level of uh, failures to deliver in AMC Securities? Yeah, I can, sort of. I mean, there's a limit to what I'm supposed to say on this subject, uh, but I can say some things. I know it's maddening to so many of our shareholders. I read my Twitter feed, guys. I know what you think. I know what you say, because I get thousands of messages a day. And since, for those of you who didn't send Elon Musk his $8 a month for a blue check mark. Since you're limited to a couple hundred characters, you can read a tweet uh, uh, pretty fast. Um, I know you're uh, really frustrated by the high number of FTDs. And as many of you, not all of you know, but as many of you know, uh, an FTD is a failure to deliver a share within the normal trading uh, closing cycle, which is within two trading two business days of the trade. And so, uh, you know, if someone uh, uh, never delivers a share, they're breaking the law. But if they deliver the share three days late, instead of, sorry, one day late, which is on the third day, they show up as an FTD in your eyes, but the trade did consummate. A little, little slow, but it consummated. Uh, if more than a half a percent of our trading volume is in an FTD status, then we go on something called the threshold list. Uh, and we've been on and off the threshold list many times uh, in 2023, and for that matter, in 2022 uh, as well. Um, and this drives some of you like out of your minds, because I read what you say. And I say out of your minds in a nice way. I don't mean it in a nasty way, but you, you're you angry about it because you think there's something wrong going on. And again, I've got to be very careful what I say legally, but I can tell you this. On multiple occasions, even multiple occasions this year, we have gone to the New York Stock Exchange at very high levels to make them aware of our status on the threshold list. And similarly, we've gone to FINRA, which is the regulatory body of the public markets. And we are voicing your concerns. Um, and I, unfortunately, I know many of you uh, like would like to see the results of what they sent us back. Uh, it's not so easy for us to share that information with you. Um, but we're aware of the concerns, we're aware of them ourselves, uh, and we are taking them to the appropriate uh, regulatory bodies. Kelsey, that's going to do it for the prepared uh, for, for the prepared questions from the internet. Can you uh, see it, give the instructions for Q and A, please? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll now begin the question and answer session. 
Should you have a question, please press the star key followed by the one on your touchtone phone. You will hear a three-tone prompt acknowledging your request and your questions will be pulled in the order that they are received. Should you wish to decline from the polling process, please press the star followed by the two. And if you are using a speakerphone, please lift the handset before pressing any keys. One moment, please, for your first question. At this time, there are no questions. You may proceed, Mr. Mayor Rother. We are after 5 o'clock, uh, which is supposedly our cutoff. So I'm going to thank everybody for joining us today and leave you with a couple of thoughts. One, we had a fabulous quarter in the second quarter of 2023, and July was gangbusters, and August is gangbusters so far. Uh, and for those of you around the country who are listening to the United States, it's really hot in the United States right now. Most of our theaters are quite cool, and they have some really good movies on the screen. So if you haven't gone to see Sound of Freedom or Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 or Oppenheimer or Barbie or Haunted Mansion or all the other wonderful movies that are out, Go to an AMC theater near you. We'd love to see you in our theaters. Thank you for joining us today. Foreseeing the financial crisis of 2008 was the greatest mistake of my career. You see, we are paid to see the unforeseen. And I did not grasp the magnitude and depth of the financial crisis that was growing in our banking system. A crisis so large that virtually every bank in America would have failed if the government had not intervened. Every bank would have failed. And after Lehman failed, we found ourselves fighting for our very survival. We were caught in the maelstrom. We were losing hundreds of millions of dollars a week if not more. CNBC parked a van in front of Citadel waiting to break the story of our demise. But we weren't gonna give them that story. You see, each day we took the steps needed to keep our business going. We sold assets. We closed business lines. We let people go. We suspended redemptions. Our management team absorbed $500 million of costs on behalf of our investors to demonstrate our commitment to the business and our belief in the future. And each thing we did bought us one more day. And day by day, we bought ourselves a future. Often the choice was between painful and more painful. But the one thing we didn't do was put things off. By the end of 2008, we had lost half our capital. But we were still in business. And we kept our team. And our team kept fighting to buy us another day. You see, with the right people, with the ability to execute, and with the willingness to make the tough decisions, we were able to save our firm. Thomas, good to see you again. Thank, thanks for joining us. My, my first question is, are you surprised and or disappointed not, not to be a part of the hearing tomorrow? Oh, no, I'm neither surprised nor disappointed. I, this is just fine with me. Just fine. <laughs> I, I, can, I can imagine. So. What do you think will be the focus? Because there's lots of angles here, whether there was insider trading, whether the likes of Robinhood uh, hurt their customers, and whether the likes of Citadel are abusing their power. What, what do you think is the key focus and the likely outcome? So what I would like to point out here, that we have come dangerously close to the collapse of the entire system, and the public is seems to be completely unaware of that, including Congress and the regulators. 
So, so let me explain to you that on, on January 26th, game had closed at $77 a share. The following day, it closed at 148 The following morning on January 28th, the stock opened at 355 and traded up to 480 At the same time, game had 50 million registered shares outstanding and the short interest of 70 million shares. In addition, there were about one and a half million calls, which would call for 150 million shares. When the shorts, when, if the shorts, uh, sorry, if the longs repay their margin loans and exercise the calls, their brokers would have had to be, would have been obligated by the rules as they are today to deliver to them 270 million shares while they on, by only 50 million shares existed. So when the shorts cannot deliver the shares, the broker representing the longs must, must, by the rules of the system, go into the market and buy the shares at any price, pushing the price into the thousands. So as the price goes higher, the shorts default on the brokers. The brokers now must cover themselves. They push the price further up. So the brokers default on the clearing houses, and you end up with a complete mess that is practically impossible to sort out. So that's what almost happened. To avoid this in the future, the SEC needs to immediately call for reporting of short interest on a daily basis because they are currently only reported twice a month. And I think they should increase margin requirements on shorts by 1% for every short, every percent of short interest. That would solve the problem. This is a gaping hole so that didn't had before because our short squeezes are considered market manipulation, which is illegal. But so therefore nobody did it, but with these uh, social platform, platforms, people can just chit chat and uh, suddenly a short right. interest emerge without pointing at any one person who is guilty, right? So, so Thomas, I mean, it, it's, it's extremely complicated and, and they'll have to try to explain all this market structure in between some of the, the populist grandstanding from, from members of Congress tomorrow. But ultimately, who are you saying is to blame, if anyone? For what happened? No, it's nobody. Nobody is to blame. There is a hole in the system that we immediately have to stop. There's a hole Which is in the short, short interest reporting. Short, short squeezes. Sorry. You're you're saying that is the short interest reporting. That's that's what was happening here. That was the problem. No, the problem was that the the there is no increased margin requirements at shor on shorts as the short interest increases. As a matter of fact, we, most people don't even know what the short interest is because it's only reported once every, twice every month. What, what portion, Thomas, of your trading uh, is payment for order flow? I know, I know it's a smaller percentage than... than